so good morning. Thank you for joining us in this second lecture. Um, today we will have a little short presentation at the beginning uh, about the model, and then we will have like a tutorial of how to use the model, and the idea is to you to follow the tutorial to know how to use it. And well, unlike the the yesterday presentation, if you have any question, you can. Uh, interrupt me in the during the presentation. So um, the idea is to be like m a more interactive uh, session this time. So yeah, um, first we will be reviewing the classification model that I presented yesterday, uh, which is uh, an interpretable uh, classification using the dempster Sheffer theory. Yeah. So, well, you know me, I'm Sergio Peñafiel, <laughs> uh, the Master in Computer Science from Chile. And this was part of my thesis work. So, um, the first thing we need to know is what is dempster Sheffer theory, which is the, the mathematical background that is behind uh, the model. Um, this is um, a new mathematical framework that some author proposes in uh, some years, decades ago. Um, it's a framework for uh, making inference and uh, reason with uncertainty. It's like the probability theory, the Bayesian theory that we may know, that you assign probabilities to events, and then you can compute, for example, the uh, expected values or uh, the probability of an event, and you can make inference or from this uh, frame. The dempster Sheffer theory is the same, but building all the elements uh, from another perspective, uh, taking into account the uh, uncertainty, the certainty of the events, and the uncertainty in all of the process. So some authors call the dempster Sheffer theory like a generalization of the Bayesian probability theory because every uh, scenario in the Bayesian theory is uh, an scenario in the dempster Sheffer theory. So you can express everything that uh, is in the normal probability theory here. Um, but you can express more uh, other uh, scenarios. This uh, theory is uh, widely used in decision-making uh, systems or decision-making support system uh, because you can ask, for example, experts uh, if they agree with a certain statement or condition or anything, and you have a procedure to combine the evidence of all the sources you have to produce an, an output. Yep. So, uh, in the dempster Sheffer theory, the basic element is uh, this one that we call a mass assignment function. Yeah? And a mass assignment function is uh, the equivalent to a probability in the Bayesian theory that you assign a, a value, which is called a mass, to the outcome source of certain a process. For example, in this case, uh, we have um, like um, the expected if tomorrow will be rainy or sunny, right? In the classical probability theory, you will assign, for example, 40% to one uh, of the outcomes and 60 for the other, right? In the dempster Sheffer theory, you assign this to the power set of the outcome, right? So the, the power set is like all the possible choices that you can make if you if we allow you to pick more than one um, element. So for this case, when you have two outcomes, we have four uh, subsets, right? Which is the, the first is the null set. That means that uh, neither sunny or rainy will be tomorrow, which is... Uh, um, maybe it would be some contradiction there. So generally this null set has a mass of zero. And then we have the, the singletons that are, if I pick only the rainy uh, subset of the event, we assign them a probability and that means that uh, it's the certainty that I have uh, that 
tomorrow it will be raining. The same for the sunny. If I pick only the sunny subset, the singleton, you have uh, the certainty that I have to, to, um, to be sunny. And we have this uh, complete set, like sunny or rainy. That means that uh, either of these uh, two outcomes will be the response. And you may be wondering why this is an option in the uh, demsel Sheffer probability theory. And that is because of the uncertainty. This is a measure, finally, of un the uncertainty that I have uh, in the problem. For example, if I am not a meteorologist and I don't know anything about the weather, maybe I will set this value to a very high value because I don't know the process, I am not an expert. But if I am certain about some of the outcome, we can uh, move the mass from this uncertainty set to one of the other ones. And this allows us to uh, express uh, the uncertainty explicitly in this uh, package of masses. Yeah. Um, the dempster Sheffer theory proposes also a, a procedure called uh, the Dempster rule that you can combine, uh, combine different uh, mass assigned functions. So if, for example, one meteorologist said that this will be the setup for tomorrow, and another have uh, other masses, you can combine them to produce a new mass assigned function that represents the combination of these two. So, um, so this is the basic setup of the theory. You can deep, uh, go deeper in the theory, make all the mathematics, but that's the basic. Uh, the mass assigned functions have to uh, have some restrictions. The mass value must, must sum one, like in probability theory. The null set is always zero um, because there is an outcome. The null set is not expressing anything new. Um, and uh, well, there are other metrics like the belief, which is the minimum support for an an outcome, the uh, plausibility, which is the maximum support of an outcome. Um, then um, the theory can be viewed as uh, working with probabilities, but not exactly one number, uh, instead having ranges of uh, probability. For example, you can say that it will be rainy between the range of uh, 0 0.32 to 0 0.92, which is this plus this. So this is the range of the probability for the first uh, outcome, and you have another range for this from 0, 0, 008 to 0, 068. Um, so you can, uh, some authors see the theory like uh, working with probabilities, uh, but using ranges instead of uh, uh, numbers, right? So we took this theory uh, and put it in a classifier, <laughs> and that is what uh, I propose. So uh, this was the chart I showed yesterday uh, um, with the trade-off between the accuracy and the interpretability. And we saw that there is no uh, model that was high accurate and high interpretable. And our proposed models, um, we would like to be in this part of the chart, in the a mid zone of the accuracy, not the, the super high uh, accurate modes, but being interpretable. And to do that, we propose this model, which is the uh, dempster sheffer uh, classification model. And we use a uh, gradient descent to optimize the, um, the values for, for this model. We will see that uh, in a minute. But some highlights of the model, because I am proposing a new model, right? And you can uh, address some of the most common uh, problems in classification. For example, uh, we can make the model uh, be able to handle missing values, like without needing to input values or any other uh, strategy. Um, we can have, for example, a procedure to include expert knowledge in the model directly um, and being interpretable and, and extensible, 
many things that other the other dimensions as we 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 would like to have in these models. So how the model works? The first is that the model is rule based. Yeah. So and the rules are uh, in the model in the context of the model are defined as uh, the combination of one statement or condition that we can verify with the data and a mass assigned function uh, attached to this condition. So for example, we can have, in this example, it's x uh, greater than four, but we can have, for example, one uh, condition that say the age of the patient is greater than 20 years, for example. So, and then, um, this rule will apply for adult patient, right? And the mass assigned function, the idea is to, if this condition is true, so we have this evidence about the problem uh, that we are solving. For example, in the stroke risk prediction problem that we saw yesterday, uh, you have two options, right? You have a stroke, no stroke, and the, um, and the uncertainty. Uh, so, for example, you can have one rule that is if the patient has diabetes, that we know that is one of the most important rules. And then these values will uh, provide you the evidence that supports one of the outcomes for this, uh, for the condition that you put in the rule. So that's the idea of the rule in the context of the model, to have evidence attached to conditions. Um, so the model works with uh, these rules, you have to define the rules. Uh, that, that's uh, the first step for working with the model. And that can be done by two um, uh, alternatives. Um, we can use expert knowledge for, uh, for providing the rules. So uh, we can ask experts who, 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 what they think are important for prediction and we can put them in the, into the, the, the condition of the rules. Or we can uh, generate them automatically using a statistic, for example, or something like that. Uh, you see the range of one variable, you make splits, and you uh, create one rule for each split. So the, the conditions must be set uh, in the first step. Um, they are unchanged during all of the process. But the mass values are learned by the model in the training process. So in the beginning, the, the model starts with a high uncertainty a value, and the, the other ones are close to zero because we don't know, in advance, we don't know anything about the, the outcomes. And uh, during the training process, these uh, masses values are adjusted to the optimal values for the, for the prediction. So, yes? Uh, in the case of, yeah, the, it depends on the number of outcomes you have. Uh, if you have only two, like in this example, there is one row for uncertainty. But if you have three, you have the power set of this, which is uh, eight, right? So you have uncertainty for each combination of uh, outcomes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in this implementation, we use the second alternative to have one row for uncertainty, but the model support this other uh, also. Because, mainly because of the um, exponential behavior of the, um, uh, of this table. I mean, if you are classifying into 10 classes, you have more than a thousand rows, and it can be very expensive to compute. So uh, we use one row for uncertainty, but we also did a binary classification, so that, that's equivalent. Yeah, because uh, one of, uh, every one of these is a parameter that the model has to, to tune. 
So if you have many of them, you need more data to, to come. Uh, so it's not feasible. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so the, the prediction process of the model uh, works like this. This is the, uh, the chart. We have the input vector, the x, the input vector, and we have our rule set, all the rules that we defined in the previous step. Um, the first uh, thing that the model does is to select the rules, the only the rules that uh, the record that we are seeing uh, satisfy. Yeah? And to, so in this example, uh, these and these other two rules are true, the condition are true for this uh, record. And we combine them, the mass assign function, using this uh, Dempster rule that I said before, to uh, have only a, a, a mass assign function for the combination of these other. And with this mass assign function, which is the combination of this, uh, we estimate the, the class with the maximum probability because we can uh, go from uh, Dempster Sheffer to probabilities. The, there is like transformation that allow us to do that. So we can transform this a mass assign function to a probability distribution. And this is what the model uh, outputs. The, and the, the, um, the class with max estimated probability. So in the first uh, like iteration of this, obviously the, uh, the uncertainty is very high. So this value uh, of the resulting um, estimated probability will be uh, practically all uncertainty, full uncertainty, but um, we can apply the gradient descent technique to optimize the mass values. So uh, for the training process, uh, this is supervised learning, so we know the class of this record yeah, in the training set. Uh, what we do is the same, they predict the, the value of uh, the class of x using the same procedure, but uh, when we have the, the estimated class, we can compare uh, this class to the actual class of the, the record, yeah, and compute the loss between these two um, outcomes. So the loss function could be the mean square error, cross entropy, anything, and what we can do is to uh, update the initial mass values, which is these uh, values uh, in, the, in the rules, in the mass assign function from the rules, uh, using gradient descent. So we can uh, compute the derivative of this function we, with respect to every uh, one of these values, and we can apply uh, some optimizer to that. For example, simple gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent, uh, Adam, anything, to uh, update this value. Yes? So in, you repeat this for all of the records in your data set, right? Uh, using the same procedure. And then you repeat this multiple times, like in neural networks. The, when you process the full uh, training set, that's called one iteration or one epoch. And then you uh, do this uh, another time and, uh, until the, the loss is, uh, or the variation in the loss is low. So the model have uh, converted to the optimal values. So after this training process, the mass values of all of the rules, the original rules, are uh, updated to the optimal values for the prediction of this uh, Task, right? Yeah, so you can see that, the, for example, if this is a symbolic value, uh, you have the combination, which is a formula, and then the transformation, which is another formula, and then the loss is also another formula. So finally, you have an expression which is very large, but you have this original value somewhere in the in the formula, so you can uh, compute the derivative with respect to that value and update the, the mass accordingly. Yeah? 
Uh, yeah, we do that using automatic differentiation, which is something that we will be uh, talking in the next uh, presentation. <laughs> we will see this uh, particular process in detail in the implementation in the next uh, presentation. So, uh, for now, it's important just to know that the, the, the masses are updated to the optimal values using this procedure. So if the masses are, after the training process, updated to these optimal values, uh, we can uh, sort the, the rules according to one indicator. For example, this is the indicator that we use, which is the geometric mean uh, between the class of, uh, the mass of one class and the uh, complement to the uncertainty. And that gives us an order for the rules, uh, which uh, tell us which rule is more important for the prediction of this class and which are less important for the prediction of this class. Um, uh, and with that, we can uh, have our, the interpretability uh, result because after sorting the rules using this indicator, we know that this is the most important rule of all of the rules that we uh, propose in the first uh, place. So um, we can uh, show that as a as a interpretable result, right? And this produced the the tables that uh, we saw uh, yesterday. Yeah, the the this gamma indicator is uh, measuring the importance of the rule to the prediction of the class K. Um, this is something that we uh, propose. Maybe there are other indicators to, to measure the same thing. But the idea is to, if we have a high mass for the class uh, K and a low uncertainty, so this value is, is uh, low, uh, so this uh, geometric mean would be a high value and the, the rule would be uh, sorted in, in the first. Uh, play. This is descending by, by the way. Yeah, so these are the three tasks that the model uh, can do. The prediction, of, of course, the training process, and the interpretability, which is new. And as I said uh, in the beginning, the idea is to show you, not only theoretically, how this uh, model works, but also in, in practice. So for today, we have a demo hey, using actual code and the implementation of the model and how to, how to use. Yeah. So we have here um, a Jupyter notebook in Python. The implementation is in Python, right? Uh, um, the uh, you can find the model here. This is the the repository of the model, which is public. So you can go to this uh, URL, which is uh, my repo. I, I don't know how to send you this link, but uh, um, wow, okay, we can continue. Uh, this is the repository for the method that I uh, was talking. The, a classifier using the search of and gradient descent. Uh, and in the readme, you have a, um, a little bit about the, the implementation, uh, how to install it. You can install it like any other package using a pip install or other installer. Um, you, uh, it can be imported. We have different uh, implementation of the model. We have three. Um, the one that uh, this, the last one, which is the most new implementation, is the best one because it's achieved better performance on uh, and can handle multi class classification. Um, and you can use it la, uh, like um, uh, any other model of. Uh, machine learning, for example, in, if you are using scikit-learn, uh, you know that you can have these methods fit and predict 
to train and predict new values. So this is uh, how the model works. The, the, um, the, the details are here, but and we, I, I would like to show you just like a simple example um, of the model. So, um, yeah, the first thing is to install the, uh, the model. Like, as I said before, you can use pip install and put in the, the URL of the, the repo there. And this will install the, uh, the dependencies and the model itself. Yeah. Okay, so it would be no problem there installing that. And uh, for this example, we we uh, uh, be doing like the hello world of classification, which is the uh, the prediction of the iris dataset. Yeah, so we take the dataset uh, of this, uh, which is very known, right? The, the is you have only four um, attributes about the, the features of these flowers. And then you have the species that corresponds to this, um, to this data set, right? You may know all of this. <laughs> um, so this is, we will apply the model to this uh, just to show you the, the, um, a, a basic example. Right, there are some visualization here about the, the data set uh, and the idea is to predict the speeches, the last column, using the, the other four attributes as simples, right? Ah, yeah, yeah, it's a feature of Google Colab that you can uh, click this button and generate charts for you. So, uh, just to visualize the, the information. So, uh, in this case, um, we will be doing like a normal procedure of uh, training a classifier. Uh, the first is to separate the data from the target value, the predicted class, and separate the training set to the testing set. So, what we are doing here is to um, well, first, we shuffle the data set because the, the data is sorted in the, in the first, um, um, uh, in the source. Uh, this is um, a limitation of the model that uh, the classes must be integers from 0 to 9. So we replace this with the, the values, we assign them some values. And we uh, enforce them to be all numeric values. We use the 30% um, uh, for testing and the 70% for training. We split them. Uh, and uh, after that, uh, we have these four uh, variables that uh, holds for the training set, for example. Um, yeah, which is a matrix uh, of the characteristics. Every row is a record, every column is a feature, right? And we have the, uh, the classes associated to this uh, training values, right? They, they must be in NumPy arrays uh, and matrices to, in order to work that uh, are the model. So this is data processing, right? Um, the model itself can be uh, imported um, as it is here. We are using, uh, uh, like I said before, we have very different implementation of the model. So uh, first we have a very naive implementation which follows the procedure that I said before without doing anything uh, smart or and then we apply some tricks to, to make it faster. And the fastest model the, the, is this, the ES classifier multi-Q. Uh, so you can import it from the DSGD uh, library that we installed in the beginning. 
Uh, and this, uh, well, uh, there is some documentation that you can check in order to know which parameters you have, uh, uh, you can pass to the model. You can also check the GitHub. Here are the, the parameters, uh, the, like the hyperparameters of the model. Uh, and we need to instantiate this model, right? So we create a new instance of the classifier multi queue and we pass the, um, uh, these uh, parameters that are control parameters for the uh, training and the, um, uh, for the training mainly. The, the first one is the only required parameter that tells the number of classes because according to this value, the classifier took different strategies. Um, then we have the iterations, the number of epochs. Uh, we can define a range. Uh, for example, we force that uh, there will be a minimum of 50 epochs and a maximum of 400. Uh, we have the flag that is the build mode to, to know what it, the model is doing when we apply the, the training. We can change the loss function. We are using here the mean square error. You can use cross entropy as well. Uh, the num workers is the, um, uh, the numbers of threads that the model will use to, to parallelize the computation. And this, the mean delta loss is the value, the threshold value in which if the loss changes less than that, so we consider that the model uh, have converged. So these are control value uh, attributes for the training process, like I said before. And um, this model uh, implements the scikit-learn interface of classification models. So uh, every uh, method that you use in scikit-learn library, like feed, predict, predict, prob, and many others, uh, will work here. Yeah, we, we implement this. Um, uh, this interface, and this is an, so. This is the fit model, which trains the the models, make all the the computation of the Dempster rule, the select of the rules, and optimizing values, gradient descent. All of this is packaged in this method, and you have to pass uh, the training set, uh, the features, the target classes, and then you have a. Um, some uh, other attributes to define the rules, right? Because, uh, like I said before, you can input the rules manually. I mean, you can, in between these two steps, you can add the rules to the model. There is a method called add rule that, uh, that allows you to do that. But you can also generate the rules automatically. And we have this, uh, uh, flags or parameters to uh, control the rule generation, right? If the model uh, doesn't have rules uh, and we are asking to, to train it, it will generate automatically the rules. So you can tell the model if you want to add single rules, that is, for example, one attribute. Uh, you see the range of the attribute, you make a splits uh, and make one rule for each split. This, the number of splits or breaks are controlled by the next uh, attribute, which is the single rule breaks. In this case, we are making three rules for each uh, attribute. Um, then we have uh, other, for example, uh, mul these add mult rules means that uh, the model can also uh, find which pair of attributes uh, have higher variance, for example, and make them uh, make combination rules for, for that also. Um, but in this case, it's, it's set to false. Only We will be only um, viewing single rules. And then uh, there are other parameters to, to know the column names, to make uh, the model print the values correctly. And we have this uh, to print the progress uh, during the, the training. So if we run this, you can see that the model is training. This is the number of uh, iterations that the model uh, have 
processed, and this is the loss in each iteration. So it takes some time <laughs> because this is a very small data set, right? It's like only 150 rows, uh, and it took like nine seconds. <laughs> so the model is not super fast like uh, other models that you may be used to, but it, it it worked, right? It, it, the loss, I can show you this uh, again. <laughs> so the loss is one at the beginning and the loss is, well, uh, this converges faster, but the loss is uh, decreasing in, during the, the iteration. Well, I don't know. Ah, yeah, because we are retraining the process, so the model have converted already. Uh, yeah, we have a single, uh, we can see that if we turn this to true. Yeah, so here are the actual rules that the model uh, uses. So uh, it generates, uh, for example, for the first one, the sepal length, uh, it generates all these five uh, uh, rules, right? Uh, for four rules, sorry. Um, it uh, and all of these rules are uh, associated with the mass assigned function that you see here, right? This is like the table that I showed in the beginning for the first class, the second class, the third class, and our center. So here we have all the rules that the model generates and the optimal values that the model reach after the the fitting. So in this example, for this setting, we have like 50, 60 rules um, for all of these um, attributes. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, this is done automatically by uh, looking at the training set and uh, figuring out uh, where are the best split with uh, following some strategy. For example, you can have the range and split it evenly. Uh, I mean, if, the, if this is going from, from zero to 10 and you make a four split, you might doing one and 2.5, 7.5, or yeah, or you can do it yeah, by frequency. You can control this uh, rule generation uh, also, but uh, the default is to use this even, uh, the groups have even a uh, number of instances. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, one of the main limitations of the model, uh, in my opinion, is that rules are uh, are defined in the beginning and they are not changed in the training process. So you define this value uh, in the generation of the rule and this value doesn't change in the training process. The only values that changes are this one, the, the ones in the mass assign function. And this is something that we can improve for, for, for the model. Ah, yeah. This is the mass assigned function associated to this rule. So this is the mass for the first class. This is the mass for the second class, the mass for the third class. The first class is the, the one that we define here. So the first class is like the Setosa species. The second one is the Virginica and the other Versi color, right? It's like the it's like this table that I showed before. Um, are the are these values, right? The the values for the first class, the second class. Here we have three classes, so we have another row, and the value for the uncertainty. They are uh, they are here. Uh, no, I mean the, these values are uh, are optimized uh, during the training process. Ah, uh, yeah, in the beginning, uh, the 
the mass values are set uh, to, to random values or to, to, to high uncertainty and low uh, for this, but during the training process, these uh, values changes and this, they are optimized to the optimal values for the prediction. Um, Yeah, it's like the probability, but also tells you the uncertainty of the, the rule. For example, if we we may find a rule with high uncertainty, like this one or this one. Uh, so the model tells you that uh, if you have one record in uh, with sepal length between these two ranges, uh, you are not able to assign one class because this doesn't give you any information and uncertainty is too high. Yeah, that's that's the the meaning of these rules, and we can see that are, they are very uh, interpretable. We can just go and see this list and 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 I extract knowledge from that. Uh, yes, this is then the next step. <laughs> so uh, we can, yeah, but because we have these uh, rules fit with the optimal values, but we need to know if the model is uh, accurate, because if we don't have an accurate model, then these rules uh, doesn't apply to the task. So we can predict the testing set. Um, this is what we, we usually um, do for, for uh, yeah, evaluating the performance and we can uh, uh, make the performance evaluation between the prediction of the testing set and the actual classes of the testing set. And here we have uh, some uh, results. So the overall accuracy is 0.94, which is high, not too high, right? <laughs> uh, and there we have another uh, metrics. For example, F1 score is from uh, 0 0.92 to 0 0.97 for all these classes. And in general, the, the classification is good for this problem, right? Uh, you may think that our models like dry and boosting give you 99%. That's okay, but uh, this model gives you these rules, the interpretability. That that's the 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 win. Uh, you can see the confusion matrix here also. The most of the records are in the diagonal. Some of them are misclassified. Ah, the support metric is the number of records in the testing set that belongs to this class. Yeah. So for unbalanced data set, this is an important metric because you may have few records of one class and many others for, for the other. And the support uh, showed this uh, imbalance. In this case, it's very balanced. Um, yeah, so the model, um, is accurate. It's not the most accurate model, but it's okay. So we can uh, trust the, the rules predicted by, by the model. And instead of looking in this uh, long table and, and, and searching which rules are most important for each class, we have uh, this other method that is print most important rules that gives you a report of these uh, rules. So uh, for each class, we have the first class, for example, the Setosa uh, speeches, uh, and they are the top rules for, for predicting this, this class. So we have like the rule six that said that the sepal width is between these values. 
eh, de más for the, the cetosa eh, singleton is very, very high, 0.96, and uncertainty is very low, as you can see. So uh, this is the most important rule for this class, and you can start making uh, uh, um, make sense these uh, rules or make inference of, of what you know about this. And then the second most important rule is this one and, and so on. So if you see there are like uh, here, these four rules are like the most important rules for this class. Um, maybe you can train a, a model only with these rules and it could uh, perform similar to, to this one. You have the same for the next class. So this is the, the second class, the Virginia class. And in this case, the most important rule is uh, this rule 11 that said the pattern length is greater than some value. And then you have another uh, high uh, mass, low uncertainty rule. Um, so you can check what are the characteristics of this group and the same for the last one, right? Uh, in this case, the, there is a rule that has one uh, mass for the singleton. That means that in the training set, probably all of the values are uh, between these uh, numbers. So it converts to that. Um, and so on. So you have like a, a representation, a characterization of each class uh, using this class. So you can tell a user, for example, an expert, depending on the, on the, on the problem, that for this uh, uh, outcome, these are the most important uh, rules or features that we, that we see. So this is the, the the power of interpretability and of the, of the model in general. Um, not necessarily, you have to compute the Dempster rule between all the, the rules that applies to the records. For, so for example, if you have one record that uh, satisfy rule 10, but also satisfy, I don't know, rule four. You have to combine these two, this mass assign function with this one, and this will give you a new mass assign function. That is the combination for these two, and this is the reported uh, outcome for this record. If it satisfies the first one, most probably the combination will do a Um, I mean, in the beginning, the rules don't belong to any class. They have all the classes, as you can see here. Uh, these are the most important for this class, but you also have values for the first class, the second class, and the third class. So uh, this is the picture like after the training, when you know which rules are important to, to one class, but in the beginning, all the rules are the same for them all, and they uh, and it start to to figure out which are the most important values in the training process. I mean, the first three rules, they are concerning the same attributes, right? The pattern length, but with different ranges, and the, ah, yeah. the mass values for each class are the same. Doesn't this con contradict? Because for each attribute, we have different settings with the same expectation. Ah, yeah. Well, we can infer from these two rules that uh, this uh, break is like artificial in general. If you have uh, the petal length between these two values, uh, you can say that it's from this class, right? And so this, uh, um, this is the, the, the conclusion from this being this. But all these values are independent. I mean, uh, this is one. All of these are parameters of the model. So are these like symbolic values that we compute the loss and make the gradient descent update? So uh, it was a coincidence that they converged to the same value, but 
uh, it will probably be explained by this, like the, the, the artificial inclusion of another break in this, uh, in the middle, yeah. Uh, yeah, so um, this is uh, according to what we see in, uh, an, an interpretability result, and it's a global interpretable result uh, if we compare what we saw yesterday, because uh, these rules apply to all instances, right? Uh, this is not like uh, local interpretability or LIME or the things that uh, sensitivity analysis that we talked yesterday, that this rule only applies to one specific record. Uh, this, uh, this is not the case. These rules apply to the whole data set. And that's um, what the, why is global interpretability. But with global interpretability, you can also um, reduce local interpretability. For example, in this case, we uh, sample an instance from the data set. So we have uh, one record with these values and we can uh, check uh, from here, right? Uh, which uh, is the predicted class, which is the third one. Uh, the actual class was this one, of course. And we can see all the rules here, uh, yeah, that apply to this instance in particular, and the mass uh, of all of them and uncertainty. So you can see here more clearly what the model does. Uh, this is like the selected subset of rules that satisfy the record and the mass values, and you combine them uh, using the Dempster rule to have one final uh, value and then transforming that to a probability and gives you this result. Here we also see that the rules are the class rule, right? Which class was our with those rules. Yeah, I mean, we have this record, and if you see the sepal length is 5.6. So this rule that said that the sepal length is between 5.2 and 5.7 is um, it's true for this record. So here we have only the rules that are true for the 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 record um, uh, and the, the the mass values of them. Yes. No, it can be in this case it was there, but in could be maybe yeah. For example, this. It's very close to one, but it's not one, and the other one is 0 0.002. Uh, I have in the previous step of this uh, output because we um, uh, we compute the combination of this all of this rule, and the combination has the uncertainty, but. Uh, to met the interface of prediction in the most uh, other computational programs, we need to assign one value to one class. And we don't have room for another <laughs> uncertainty value. So that's why we transform this uh, mass assign function to a probability distribution. We have a procedure to transform that. And this is what it is reported. But we can extract the uncertainty. I don't have a handy method to do that, but we, but this is possible. It's something that is computing the process. So it's quite reasonable now in the environment to say that you get this artifact, you will get the option. Mm. The option means that you get Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes, we can report that, and this is very interesting. <laughs> uh, I mean, you you miss this information that is in the model that we should be presented here, but 
Uh, this probability distribution uh, comes from the, the mass assigned function for the combination that has the uncertainty. So uh, they are equivalent in the sense that you are missing information, but this uh, uh, it's dependent on the previous one. So it is not like it's, it's uh, different. It's, uh, it's another representation, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we missed that information. Maybe we should show the uncertainty. Yeah, but like as. Yeah, all is very small, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but it's something that we can, we can report. So, yeah, that ends the first. I think we are in on time, right? Yeah. Um, so this model, uh, like I said in the beginning, is available here. You can use it. It's very simple as you may not do. It's like using any other model, and you gain this interpretability result. So we um, promote you to use it. If you use it, let me know, <laughs> because it's always nice to, to have another pe uh, person using this in a new scenario. Um, so I will somehow <laughs> um, uh, sharing with you this uh, collab and the link to the repo so you can try it at home or <laughs> anything, right? Yes. Uh, we have used this mode to right? And in the discussion, it was saying that uh, distributions are more good when they are not shared. Yeah. Uh, what is the, what is the <laughs> yeah. Is this? yeah, this is something that we will be talking in the next uh, lecture. Because these three methods, uh, like I said before, this is the more uh, naive of this one uh, that implements the, the procedure, like following the steps. And then you can apply some uh, strategies to skip some parts or make competition faster. And these are like uh, new versions of the same model. Or this, the first one is very limited. For example, it only works for binary classification. Then we add support for multi-class classification. And finally, we add this commonality transformation, which is a, a, a technique to make computation faster for this model. Um, but we will be reviewing this in detail in the next, in the Thursday uh, presentation, right? We will be in this uh, presentation, uh, I will show you how I make this method, how you can make uh, machine learning models. And uh, so, uh, and we will talk about the complexity and how you can improve the, the, the results, the implementation. Uh, yeah, yeah, we have another track of regression, but uh, by the time we don't have time for. Uh, Just, uh, I want you to uh, say something about this algorithm. Uh, so, if you have uh, records with missing values, uh, some very accurate uh, model cannot handle them. Yeah, it's, uh, you cannot, you cannot um, compute that because the values are missing, but uh, the values that you have are very uh, 
No, I use the PyTorch uh, okay. uh, library, but in a very low level. We will see this on Thursday also. <laughs> uh, but I use a, a method called automatic differentiation. I don't know if you know that. Um, which is a technique to compute the gradient of one expression uh, numerically while you are adding some values. And it's very uh, helpful for computing derivatives with respect to one, only one variable. So we use this for, for the implementation. Um, well, this is implemented in the PyTorch library in the very low level of the library. And I use this for, for building the, the model. No, it's something uh, that comes from the model because you, as Nelson said, you don't apply the rule. It's like uh, you don't have to apply the rule the same number of times uh, uh, for each one of them. You can, for example, have one rule that only applies to two records, right? Uh, that are the ones that are not missing in this column, and it's okay. The, the model supports that. Uh, 